So, Jacob, where would you like to begin? <laughs> yeah, Vanessa, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm here and excited to talk about my book, my new book, my new anthology, a collection of chapters called Paranormal Ruptures, um, Critical Approaches to Exceptional Experiences. And so I'm sort of trying to inaugurate or kick off, you know, what I've termed critical parapsychology. And what, what that entails in general is sort of marrying um, critical theory, uh, which comes out of uh, different um, influences, including Marxism, including some postmodernism, deconstruction, and trying to bring that into dialogue with uh, paranormal studies or parapsychology. And so, you know, I'm I'm interested in looking at ways that the paranormal sort of challenges normative or mainstream models. And what can it teach us? What can it teach us about the, the strangeness of human experience and and you know the impact that that those that strangeness might have on society, how we organize our institutions. Oh, that's very interesting twist. Um, I definitely think that's really important because like literally everybody that comes to the office has some sort of strange experiences that they feel like other people are going to think they're crazy if they find out, you know? And it's like, well, if all of us have these experiences, then maybe this is part of human experience and it's not so abnormal after all. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, that's sort of why I chose the, the term exceptional experiences. Uh, it, it comes from the work of Raya White, who is a feminist parapsychologist, and she she had the the fuller term, exceptional human experiences. And so, you know, nowadays, you know, scholars kind of shorten it a bit to just exceptional experiences, but it it you know it does speak to the richness, the fullness of what it means to be human, and that includes things that are odd, they defy explanation, they, uh, you know, push the boundaries of what's acceptable, of what's scientific. And so, you know, I really appreciate that sort of um, validation and honoring, you know, people's stories. Um, and, you know, there's some, some talk about, you know, the importance of narrative, of discourse in the book. And that's very different than the traditional parapsychological approach you know, which is experimental, right, in a laboratory, you know, trying to isolate variables and control for psi. Uh, so, you know, so it's, 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 it's messy, right? Human experience is messy. And, and that's okay, right? We've got qualitative approaches, critical approaches to help us to make sense out of, you know, what does it mean to be human? So how did this book come about? Where did the idea come from? Or what was the kind of evolution of it? It's a great question. Uh, yeah, I had sort of been thinking about, you know, because I have training and interest in both, in critical theory and parapsychology. And so, you know, over the last, you know, three, four, five years, I had written a little bit about, you know, how the two can kind of dialogue or interface and, you know, I think it was maybe last um, last spring or last fall, something like that. You know, I, I just thought, you know, somebody needs to take the initiative to really kind of solidify this subfield, right? This subfield of parapsychology, you know? And so I, you know, one way I was thinking of doing that and what the book resulted in is sort of collecting um, chapters from scholars in the field that they're both traditional parapsychologists. I'm thinking of Dr. Simmons Moore. Dr. Christine Simmons Moore has a chapter on uh, parapsychology and fractals. Okay, so how fractals can sort of uh, help us locate sort of the boundary nature of exceptional experiences. They offer a different way of thinking, a different epistemology. So, so traditional parapsychologists like Dr. Simmons Moore, but also um, critical theorists. For example, um, Dr. Tim Beck has a book on um, neurodivergent belief uh, in a post-normal world and tries to understand the what he calls the magic of algorithms. 
uh, in this kind of hyper technological world that we live in that these algorithms facebook instagram you know google algorithms sort of operate in a sort of a traditionally a magical way you know so he does more critical theory but you know it was sort of nice to be able to have um you know, a diverse group of scholars that can speak to both, you know, can speak to both parapsychology and to this more critical approach. That's super interesting, getting people kind of outside of their comfort zone a little bit, even in the writing. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's all, you know, writing is always a risk, but I think writing about these paranormal topics is maybe even a little bit riskier, you know, because I think in the academy, in the university, you know, these topics are maybe looked down upon um, a bit, people don't take them seriously, or in worst case, they're pathologized, you know, they're diagnosed, you know, somebody, you know, that says they're, they're hearing voices, maybe a clinician diagnoses them, diagnoses them with schizophrenia, you know, so um, yeah, so it was, I really appreciated the contributors uh, to the anthology because, yeah, it takes a lot of um, courage and bravery to kind of put yourself out there and explore this this terrain that really hasn't been explored before. And what's traditional parapsychology training like? <laughs> well, <laughs> So there's not a lot of places uh, around the world where you can, you know, go to university, go to school to get trained as a parapsychologist. I'm thinking, you know, off the top of my head, what comes to mind is the University of Northampton uh, in the United Kingdom uh, would be one such place, but they're they're very limited. Um, in, That's where Alan Moore is, right? Is that where Alan Moore lives? I think so. <laughs> I, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Chris Rowe, Dr. Chris Rowe is over there. Uh, he's a well-known parapsychologist. Uh, Dr. Callum Cooper is there. You know, there's, a, there's a couple. And and so, you know, that's, that's one place uh, for sure. And actually at the university where I teach, we don't have a formal program uh, in parapsychology, but we offer courses um, in parapsychology. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Simmons Moore, offers undergraduate, graduate courses in parapsychology. And I'll offer uh, usually a special topics course. I think last year I taught a seminar course called Paranormal Encounters, um, which kind of just looked at, you know, these sort of strange encounters that we have uh, that inc can include maybe cryptids, apparitions, uh, UAPs, and, you know, sort of different explanations, uh, both psychological, uh, parapsychological, uh, uh, medical, so on and so forth, different explanations for understanding uh, these sort of sorts of encounters. Yeah, I feel like this is becoming more and more popular, though, like at this time than it has been for a while. And I think the Internet has a lot to do with that because people can kind of talk more directly to each other instead of always having to go through like gatekeepers that like choose our music, choose our television, choose what we're watching. There's like much more opportunity for people to put their own stuff out there and talk to each other directly. And everyone's kind of like, yeah, that happens to me, too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I think so, too. I mean, you know, the transpersonal psychology and parapsychology share a lot of similarities. And I, my sense is also that people are sort of more open to talking about these spiritual, paranormal kinds of experiences. And, and absolutely, I think that the, the way that technology uh, interconnects our world and for the example, uh, or the rise of AI, artificial intelligence, there's actually a chapter, the last chapter in the book, uh, Chris Sean uh, details sort of the implications of these large language models, uh, like Lambda, ChatGPT, and even Neuralink, uh, which is Elon Musk's sort of initiative to interface machines with our brains that would allow for telepathy, you know, uh, technologically assisted telepathy, you know, which is interesting, you know, that, that sort of science in some strange way, science and technology is catching up with parapsychology, you know, by making these things 
technologically possible. Um, so yeah, so I think technology, social media, all of this sort of is coming together and, and hopefully, right, making these experiences more appropriate and acceptable to talk about. Yeah, because I think it's important also, like you said, not to pathologize, not to diagnose and label people. But of course, in other cultures and still to this day and in the past, you know, lots of times these experiences are venerated or listened to of like, okay, what's going on here? Like, what can we learn from this? This person has like a sort of sight or a vision or a way of experiencing that not everyone else has. And that can be useful and has a place in society. So it's really, I feel like we're really losing out on a lot by by just like discounting these things and either discounting them or just like you said pathologizing them actively you know it's like really yeah it does harm to a lot of people who that happens to and also as society overall really misses out on like a whole area of research and experience that people have been experiencing for thousands of years yeah yeah i mean the you know anthropologically or culturally you know just vanessa just like you're saying you know some of these 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 people that nowadays we might say they have schizophrenia in the past they were venerated maybe as shamans as medicine men you know they have special sort of abilities to commune with with other beings that we can't see you know so uh so I, I'm not, you know, the book and myself, right, we're not so interested in, you know, discerning, you know, what we would typically call the scientific truth about what's going on, okay, you know, like, you know, is this real, is it ontological, or is it not, right, uh, there's some of that, but I think we're more interested looking at the effects that some of these, um, uh, experiences can have for society and the importance again of sort of taking pe taking these experiences seriously right and trying to understand what's going on rather than you know dismiss them pathologize them and so on so you know it's a sort of more holistic and a fuller approach uh, in some ways than the traditional scientific model which which really is parapsychological you know parapsychology is really good at normal science you know typical science and, and that's great right i think we need that but i also think the conversation should be broader and we should bring in you know cultural social and historical factors to really help us make sense out about what about what's going on yeah, that's super interesting. I just recently wrote my first kind of novel. It's like a cut up novel. So it's just like scenes, different scenes that you kind of move between uh, or the protagonist moves between. And some of them are cut from my real life. And I remember like thinking about, you know, my younger years stuff. Like I really wanted to be a parapsychologist in high school. <laughs> and I used to be obsessed with the film, The Entity. And I remember in my AP physics class, we were supposed to, you know, do a presentation on and things with physics and I decided to do it on metaphysics <laughs> and I like showed clips of this film the entity and like talked about poltergeists and things <laughs> it's pretty funny <laughs> so not, not much has changed <laughs> right <laughs> oh, gosh. how did you get interested in it oh that's a that's a really good question it's funny I I was talking to somebody about this the other day it's I don't know how to say it. It's sort of um, some of it is kind of happenstance. Uh, some of it's interest and it, it sort of circles back around to me. So like, you know, I was, I, for example, like when I was growing up, I remember, um, you know, middle school or even high school, you know, having books, collecting books on um, UFOs and aliens. Like, I, I don't know. I was just really interested in that. And kind of, you know, that fell away for a while. And then when I, I actually, I came down to Georgia to go to graduate school to get my PhD at the University of West Georgia, had no idea that this, you know, was a thing. But uh, Dr. Simmons Moore uh, is a parapsychologist and the University of West Georgia has a tradition of having one parapsychologist on their faculty. And so I happened to, you know, see a, a sheet with her name on it and the handouts. And I was already down here to interview. 
I didn't know, you know, and so I sort of like circled it and I was like, oh, that's really, really interesting. And, you know, I was accepted, got in, went through the program and, you know, graduated. And then again, you know, sort of I thought after I graduated that I was going to do more of a traditional academic path in critical theory. And, um, you know, it just kind of circled back around. I got offered uh, in a, an editorship for, for Minefield, which is the bulletin of the Parapsychological Association. And so I accepted and then got really involved with the PA. I just, I was actually this past summer in August, I was the program chair for their 65th annual convention in Oslo, Norway. Oh, cool. Um, so that was an amazing experience, uh, a lot of work. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's like every time I feel like I'm maybe going to, you know, get away or do something else, you know, some, something parapsychological, paranormal kind of pulls me back in. Uh, so it, it's, yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting. I, I'm happy to do it. I like the kind of, I think the work that I'm doing is important. Um, and just, you know, just the importance of raising awareness and helping people, helping people that have these strange and anomalous experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm always, at my one of my favorite bands is this band called Coil, and one of their lines is, give sanity a longer leash. And I'm always into giving sanity a longer leash because it's too constricted. We need to get out of all this, like, what's normal box and like, yeah, branch out because people are different and weird and life is weird. And that's great. <laughs> yeah. I wish I knew about this conference in Oslo. That's so close. I would have been interesting to go to. Yeah. Yeah. Next time. Uh, next time. That's right. <laughs> in, in, incidentally, you know, if you're interested, we do have t tomorrow, uh, or I'm sorry, not tomorrow, in two days, which was that November 10th, we're having an online on, um, encore of the of the convention so you can sign in and and watch all the different talks they were they were videotaped there's going to be discussion so it's this whole weekend so oh, starting cool. this, yeah this friday saturday and sunday i'll be there all weekend um i think all you have to do is if you're interested in, just go uh google parapsychological association uh convention and it should come right up oh cool Maybe yeah. I'll make sure I get this podcast out ASAP so people can go to that if they want, if they're interested. There you go. That'd be great. Yeah, that would be cool because that's really interesting and different. And I didn't even know. I love finding out there's like whole things going on that you didn't even know about, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Super cool. Yeah, I originally, I was really into Stanislav Graf in my early 20s. And I, I was going to go, I was thinking of going to CIIS in California, but one, I didn't have any money. <laughs> and two, yeah, it's just like a lot, really expensive and far to go to California from Miami. But uh, I ended up going to school like, you know, in my area and then and then ended up going to like traditional analytic training in New York. And so I did that whole thing. But then, yeah, it just circles back again anyway. <laughs> I tried to go this like route and it was like, no, you're not like that. <laughs> I know it's so funny how life, life does that. It's like, you know, you just circle back, you go, you know, it's like being pulled, right? Like you can't explain it. It's just sort of, uh, you know, the way the, the rhythm of the universe is. <laughs> yeah. And I've even been getting more into young lately because I realized there is this like huge divide and like it's, it really did seem to start with like Freud and Jung split, you know, 110 years ago or whatever. And like the field has not like reconciled this. And it's like the Jungians over here, and like you can be Freudian, Lacanian, or critical theory. All this can be over here, but like don't don't talk to the Jungians. <laughs> it's like this is really unfair. And like you know, you don't have to like buy into every kind of theory in order to like find somebody useful. I mean, I feel like most theorists, I don't buy into everything they say but I've always find tidbits that are useful and I realized I had like I had like uh, internalized this kind of bias against Jung like somehow throughout my training or something when I used to really like him in high school in my early 20s and I'm like let me go back and read him again it's like he's really fun I like him you know I'm not gonna like talk to people about archetypes in session but it doesn't hurt to like read these ideas and stuff of like different kinds of things that he has especially I love synchronicity and, and individuation and things like that yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think 
I think, you know, uh, the academy and scholarship when it's at its best is not divisive, right? Oh, you know, I'm a Lacanian or I'm a Jungian, right? I don't, I don't like that. You know, I, I'm more just like what you're saying, Vanessa, you know, trying to see what, what is useful, pragmatic, the concepts, what's interesting, what I'm drawn to. You know, that to me, that's always sort of worked. And that seems like um, a, a better way, I guess. Yeah. I, and yeah, I also don't like when the academy gets too much about like, yeah, what's wrong with a theory? It's like, I've seen people give like these great presentations. They come and give a talk for free. You know, they're like using their time and like being kind to give a presentation. And then like, as soon as they're done, someone like starts picking it apart based on like what they didn't agree with, you know? And it's like, why don't we just focus on what you found useful from that talk instead of like nitpicking at what you don't agree with about what somebody said, unless it's like really egregious or something, you know, but like, <laughs> in general, you know, just like find what's useful. Yeah, I love that. And in fact, you know, I, I talk a little bit about that. I, I cite the work in the chapter one, chapter one I wrote, which is on critical theory and exceptional experiences. And I cite the work of um, Deleuze and Guattari, who were who were French philosophers. Guattari was a, a psychoanalyst trained by Lacan, you know, and they they say exactly that, right? That good good scholarship, good critical work doesn't tear down a theory, right? You you try and find what's useful and helpful and be creative with it, you know, create something new. That's kind of their tagline. You know, so I, I think that's that's so true. And I think, you know, um, hopefully I think the, the the chapters in the book, you know, try and do that, you know, try and create this new model, this new way of of trying to understand the paranormal. Yeah, no, I love to lose in battery, and I think that's really important, too. It's like it's great to study, you know, what people have said before. But at some point you have to start thinking for yourself. <laughs> Like, what do you have to say instead of just like regurgitating what so and so and so and so and so and so said? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So. Yes, yeah, so say more about your piece. Yeah. So I I kick off the, the book. So I, I write, you know, the first chapter. Um, and I I go through so five I call them five axes right that sort of bring together marry critical theory and parapsychology um you know i'm thinking one of them is you know what i call uh, strategic ontologies okay so that's kind of a mouthful but it's based on uh spivak's work who who, who they talk about strategic essentialism so in other words sometimes it's important for us to politically, strategically posit certain um, identities, if that makes sense. Okay, so, you know, it makes sense in this time and space and this his history to, to lay a claim to a certain identity, okay, for political reasons. So I, so I kind of take that idea and apply it to models of reality or ontology and say, you know, given this time and space as history, parapsychologists would do well to engage in strategic ontologies. In other words, go against the predominant ontology, which is physicalism or materialism. That's, you know, this, this what, what mainstream, you know, neurological science takes to be true that, you know, for example, the mind is reducible to brain states, okay? It's this reductive sort of understanding of, of reality, okay? And so I, I urge, you know, I, I, I urge parapsychologists and other thinkers to, to come up with different kinds of models that, that work with our political context, where we're at. You know, I'm thinking, you know, in a couple chapters later in chapter three, Jack Hunter uh, talks about uh, panpsychism, uh, which is a different model. So seeing us and the universe uh, in terms of consciousness, right? That the, the universe is, is alive, is conscious in some ways, has a has a soul uh, that that kind of combats and pushes back against this reductive ontology. So that's just one model, right? There could be many different kinds of models, but the idea is that you know we we got to think. For critical theory, we're 
critical theory always is political, taking into account the changing social and historical parameters of where we're at. You know, so we so I I want us as parapsychologists and people that are interested in the paranormal, we we get we have to think that way, right? It's not that you know the old notion of this is scientific truth. Okay, well, it, it, I mean, it could be. It is right now. Okay, but you know, in fifty years, a hundred years, two hundred years, that science, that scientific truth today, I'm going to say is it's going to change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because because of the nature of reality, because we change, because the universe changes. So, so yeah, so we got to think, got to think in those terms, and try and see 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 more of a a model that's dynamic and in flux. Yeah, I always wonder like what happened to the fact the fact that science is like full of hypotheses. <laughs> These are like maybe hypotheses that have been tested and proven a, a bunch of times, but then as soon as you learn something else, it changes things. So it's like they're all really just hypotheses and like the hypotheses that we believe right now, but you know, yeah, in the past people thought the earth was the center of the universe, etc. Now dinosaurs have feathers, which they didn't when I was a kid, you know, things like that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and seeing science, you know, I think, you know, for better or for worse, right, science has a lot of cultural and social cachet. You know, the, so, you know, if, if you say something is scientifically true, right, that carries a lot of weight, you know, which is good in some ways, but in other ways it's limiting, right? Because, because as some of the contributors point out, science is also a human social uh construction <laughs> okay right mm -hmm. so we have to remember that right science didn't just come out of thin air or was didn't it wasn't handed down by god right we created science right so there's important problems with science and critical theory in particular uh is interested in ways that for example women have been excluded from the conversation uh, ethnic minorities have been excluded, LGBTQ individuals, and, and we need to understand the sort of prejudices and the discriminatory power that is contained within one of our sort of sacred institutions, which really is science. Yeah, absolutely. Excluded at best and actively discriminated and pathologized also, just like with mental health as well yeah. and I also think of that also like with magical things like you know traditions that have been passed on for generations for thousands of years and then this this version of science which is like what western white science right basically western white male science straight male right. science his set heteronormative science um they're <laughs> like this is, you know, this is bullshit, basically. But like, you know, that Bruja has been doing that the way her mom did it and her mom did it and her mom did it, you know, and like, they wouldn't be doing it that way if they didn't find out that it worked that way, you know? <laughs> so like, that's their own science of like, this, this is how you do this spell. This is how you do this like folk magic, because this is how we found that it works. And then, you know, this other group comes along and is like, no, that's all bullshit. And you all are hysteric, right? Crazy, whatever, primitive people. Um, and they've decided it's not true. But like, you know, to other people, it is true, you know? Right, right. Yeah, and that, that, that gets at this evolving nature of science that we need to sort of realize. And, you know, in, in chapter two, um, uh, Dr. David Mitchell, who's actually a professor at CIIS, uh, in California, you know, it takes us through in some ways. So he uses um, uh, relic hominoids, okay? So in other words, like Bigfoot, Sasquatch, okay? He uses the figure relic hominoids to walk us through the progression of science and through uh, uh, the lens of Thomas Kuhn, right? And, and trying to uh, understand, you know, how these beings, right, these figures like Sasquatch, what kind of kinds of threats do they pose to um to us as humans to our institutions to our understanding of the world so it's a really fascinating chapter because it kind of gets at uh you know uh, what psychoanalysis you know does really well in terms of thinking about issues around 
you know, cannibalism, um, incest, uh, these taboos, right? These taboos that, you know, structure society, right? As Freud might say, uh, but nonetheless sort of also create this kind of dark underbelly that we don't want to look at. Totally. Yeah, it just reminds me being in Sweden, like there's this movie Midsummer that came out a couple of years ago, where they like end up, these Americans end up in this like, you know, Swedish pagan cult or something in the middle of, you know, the rural area or whatever. And like there's cannibalism happening, people are disappearing, it's like a horror film. But like Carl, my husband is like, you know, there's a point where like some of the people, like when they get to a certain phase of life, they just like jump off this cliff onto this rock and like smash themselves so that they die. And Carl said, that's a real thing. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. So it's like, that's interesting. Like people have these kind of rituals and practices that to us are like, that's barbaric. Why would you do that? But like at another point in time, that was just what you did. You know, made sense to them. Yeah, you know, I think also Swedes are very like, Scandinavians are very like collective oriented so I could see in their like collectivist kind of psyche that's like anyone who may be more infirm or something back then not now but back then like they would just be like whoop just jump off this cliff and smash yourself because it's like now we have more resources for the others you know right right yeah yeah and you know to, to me that sort of brings out what is a strand of this book and then uh, which comes from post-colonial theory or decolon decolonial theory. And that, you know, as scholars and scientists and academics and, and others, you know, we've got to be really careful about pushing this Western, this Eurocentric view of what's right, what's wrong, what's normal, so on and so forth, right? Because it, there's, there's a lot of consequences that go with that. We can obliterate cultures, obliterate belief systems, and we can cause damage to people you know, by pathologizing them, by seeing them as, as less than, as not civilized, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it's, again, you know, it's really about the sort of validating, the validation of experiences, and the taking seriously, right, in terms of research, trying to understand them, not dismiss them, not pathologize, but really try and understand anthropologically and culturally, right, how these beliefs and these experiences function um, in certain ways. And we got to sort of pay, pay honor to that. Absolutely. And I think something that you touched on before, too, is like, I don't think there's things that are supernatural. I just think that it's something that science does hasn't understood yet but like that doesn't mean you know in 50 or 100 years we might not be able to understand it scientifically you know like I imagine like even my my grandmother she passed away a few years ago but she was like a hundred and we would like FaceTime you know and show her the computer like FaceTime my sister or something and her mind was like blown like what is it like how is this happening you know <laughs> like how is she there on the screen it's like a tv but it's just talking to me and whatever it's just like was wild to her I could see her just like what is this you know but like that's yeah. just like man it's just what you do it's normal you know so it just depends on when you're born <laughs> when and where yeah yeah and I mean yeah I think you know I'm just thinking you know to the, into the future I mean you know some of the chapters touch on this I, I mentioned Christopher Sean in Neuralink and the rise of AI you know, I can't imagine, you know, where that's going to go in the next, you know, 20, well, let, I, let's just say five years, five, <laughs> 10, 20 years, you know, a, a society is going to be sort of uh, revolutionized and, and not just, not just technology too, but I think there, there's two chapters, chapter eight and chapter nine towards the end of the book that talk about, you know, what traditionally would be known as UFOs unidentified flying objects or or the, the the updated term i guess is uaps unidentified aerial phenomena right and so you know there's something there's a lot of changes happening right with let's say the powers that be the institutions in terms of you know renaming this phenomenon and broadening it right so it's not just objects right which you know we think of you know, material, hard stuff, right? Phenomena, the new term is, you know, a little bit different, 
right? That, you know, we're not, we're not sure, you know, maybe these things aren't material. Maybe there's, you know, something with consciousness going on, All right? So, you know, I, I can't imagine, I think the two chapters, chapter eight and chapter nine, do a really good job at sort of looking at the implications of, you know, taking th these experiences seriously um, in terms of encounters with UAPs and, and and the the inhabitants of these these so-called craft, uh, you know, what does that mean for our place in the world, our understanding in the world? It, it's 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 what uh, Dr. John Roberts calls a world collapse, right? This encounter with this alien being, supposed alien being, can result in this sort of you know transvaluation of everything that you know. This world collapse. And that can be really, really profound. It's important to pay attention to that because people experience that, right? It's not, these aren't just, you know, fictional stories on Netflix, right? People are, are saying that these things happen to them. So we really, you know, we want to pay attention to that and, and, and try and understand, you know, the effect that they have. Yeah, and that's really also what's at the root of a lot of things is like people not wanting to change their own view and so like anything that doesn't fit with their view it gets rejected and I think like like I think uh, Sheldon George talks about even with race like you know a lot of like people who are very married to being like the white person like they can't accept that they're not actually better than everybody else it like shatters their like sense of self you know <laughs> this like fundamental level what do you mean or like with trans you know it's like people who are very like married to like gender like I'm male or female that like collapses their whole world view and so we need to be able to teach people differently and like make a lot of different ways of being in the world you know there and present in every and everything especially in like media and film and stuff as well to show the diversity of humans because it's wonderful and so it's people like hopefully we have less of these people who just like can't deal with things that are outside of their view and then get very aggressive they don't just get defensive but they get aggressive and murder people you know yeah, yeah, that and that that hostility, right? That that need to kind of defend oneself, want defend one's ideology, one's belief system. You know, I think you know, uh, you know, chapter nine talks about that in terms of UAPs, and then chapter two talks about that in terms of the relic hominoids, the the Sasquatch. You know that that there are there's this sort of um, uh, you know, defense against these beliefs that might structure, you know, our understanding of ourselves, our religion, our belief in what's real, what's not real. And so, you know, I would say that, you know, a sign of sort of healthy psychology would be to sort of, you know, at least entertain some of these paranormal experiences, you know, and try and you know, how, see how they fit within your own worldview. You know, the, the unhealthy uh, mechanism is to kind of just reject them or, you know, to be aggressive or hostile. So it's like, you know, we, we got to at least consider these things um, and, and try and understand how we can fit them into our, our, our reality, our society. Yeah, I think so. psychological flexibility is really key so that people, yeah, understand that there's a whole breadth of experience and are, maybe get, instead of feeling like, but this is what I know, realize there's a lot of stuff you don't know. <laughs> like, there's like way more stuff you don't know than you do know, actually, all of us. So like, maybe just be curious and interested and like, oh, that's new. How interesting. Instead of like, yeah, just being like, wait, I didn't know that. Like, that must not be true or that must not be real or that's not allowed to exist. Yeah, yeah, I love that. You know, I know, like, so I'm a, I, I do therapy part time too, and that's the that's the attitude I try and bring when I'm with clients, right? Is that I want to be curious, I want to be inquisitive, right? I don't want to assume, right, what is going on for the client, and so I think that that stance, you know, you know, might be, we might call it kind of decentering ourselves. Right, that stance can be, you know, really um, informative and really sort of help you blossom, 
because you don't just assume you don't have anything to kind of lose, right? I, I just, I'm curious about, you know, my clients or I'm curious about these, you know, sort of different phenomena. Yeah, I'm curious and non judgmental. Yes, yes, definitely. Super important. Yeah. So, what other kinds of contributions are in the book? Um, let's see. Uh, so some chapters in the middle. Um, we have Claude uh, Bergman's who talks about um, the esoteric and spiritual concept of a thought form, uh, which is really interesting. It's sort of pioneer pioneering research because there's not a lot of literature outside of esoteric circles on this notion of a thought form. And so the, I think the general idea is that through trauma and other means, right, these, these you know, I mean, thought forms, these sort of um, energetic, dense energetic, uh, spiritual, esoteric things get stuck to us or stuck in us, right? And, and, and psychic healers, okay, for lack of a better term, can sort of work to kind of release them, okay, help release these thought forms. So um, it's kind of a it's, a, it's a pioneering chapter, it's a frontier chapter, just because they're, they're, there's not a lot outside of specialized literature on thought forms. Um, and then following that, we have uh, Anastasia Wasco, who talks about psychosynthesis and parapsychology in relation to trickster theory. Um, so you, I, for you know, those of you that may not know, trickster theory and parapsychology says that there's a sort of trickster nature to the paranormal because when we try and pin it down in the laboratory, when we try and understand it and you know define it, it sort of you know eludes us or it doesn't show up. And so uh so some people like George Hansen have have term have used the the archetype of the trickster to try and talk about the paranormal um, you could so, say that about the unconscious too it like slips out when you don't expect it but if you try to like make it so bad it's like no <laughs> exactly it's yeah it's, it's hard to get a hold of and so you know we got to kind of do all these acrobats and we've got to uh, you know, do all these things to not go right at it, right? But to kind of circle around it and eventually, hopefully, we can sort of say something important about it. But it, you know, it's, it's, we can't really, you know, go, go for the heart. We've got to kind of go around. So, yeah. So I think the, the unconscious, right, is like, and there's, you know, interesting work. I think, speaking of the unconscious, uh, a couple chapters, the chapter by Stephen Wibley and Peter uh, Zuckerasen, I'm sorry, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, they, they talk again about this shift from UFOs to UAPs, and they use Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis to try and understand that in terms of the, the, the shift that is taking place in the symbolic register. So the you know that's it's an important way of of the way that the symbolic structures structures the other registers the imaginary and the real, and say so they sort of take us through this and the implications that might have for you know the real or the unconscious in terms of Lacanian theory. So it's sort of sort of an interesting approach and yeah, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's What's that. going on with the UAPs? Isn't this like a thing that's happening now? Like with the Pentagon says this UAPs and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean that that so that's the official terminology, right? Is UAPs, right? And then you know, I I think from my understanding, right, the 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 Pentagon has sort of you know acknowledged that these things are real. There's been you know, footage from, I think, the Navy that's been released on these phenomena that are ongoing. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, I don't think anybody really knows. The government, at least officially, doesn't really have a clear answer about what's going on. But it's it's sort of, you know, reinvigorated the conversation in ufology, 
right? Because the because sort of seemingly out of nowhere, you know, the the Pentagon and the the government officials have sort of said that these are UAPs now; they're not UFOs. So, you know, so the the chapter, uh, you know, kind of goes into that a bit and talks a little bit about you know what's at stake in terms of having these institutions sort of push this agenda, this ideology on us. Interesting. My mom's dad was in the Air Force and like was like a bomber pilot in World War II with like one of those planes that had like the teeth on it, you know, like the spider planes that like the tiger teeth or the shark teeth or whatever. Mm-hmm. And she I always thought my mom was a little weird when I was younger because she like got, you know, went to an astrologer and had my natal chart done. And she always told me that her dad told her once you get to a certain level in the Air Force, it's like common knowledge that this stuff exists and they work with stuff and he's seen it and all this stuff. And I was like, OK, mom. But now I'm like, hmm, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I think not not just UAPs, but I think these experiences, you know, are probably more common than we realize. There's just unfortunately, there's that that social stigma, that social pressure that when people have a, a paranormal or an anomalous experience, they don't feel comfortable talking about it a lot of times. You know, so part of the work that I want to do is to make it more acceptable, you know, for people to share their stories. Uh, so that we can we can learn about these things. We can better understand, you know, the nature of human consciousness, you know, which science does not have a good theory for, right? And and understand how it's it's more it's stranger, uh, maybe even more paranormal than we really think it is. Uh, you know, so inviting that into into the conversation. Yeah, I recently I got Stanislav Grof came out with two, like a two volume set of that, like basically summarizes kind of all of his books, you know, so that you don't have to read all of them. Now he's got I guess he taught a course or something. And so then he like put the coursework in, into this two volume set, which has been really interesting to read. And like, so I read a lot of his books over the years, but it's really like laid out in this and also talks about his current thinking on old things that he wrote rather than exactly what, like maybe he's changed his view than when he first wrote the book and stuff. But he has one chapter where he like talks with a, like someone who's like a neurosurgeon basically. And the neurosurgeon is like, I have never, like I have done like, you know, this many thousands of brain operations or something. And I do not believe that that the consciousness is coming from this. Like, it's like, I've never been able to locate like where in the brain this would be produced, you know, which was interesting to hear is like a surgeon say that. And apparently he's very old now, like not not working anymore. But, um, and Stanislav Graf basically came to the conclusion that like, you know, they're, they, basically the universe is conscious and we like tap into the consciousness when we're like living in a body or whatever but that like you know uh it's not necessarily being created from us it's more something that we like tap into and then and then yeah when we're gone it's still there and maybe that's why people like can communicate with people who have died or things like that which even I've also thought about this interesting kind of like you could look thinking more critical theory but like thinking like more Judith Butler and Foucault and like how we're all kind of you know talking to reflections of each other but like it's very like intellectual and that you can basically still communicate with somebody I mean taking it to the realm where you can still communicate with somebody even if they're not there because you've like internalized this representation of them and and like that never goes away so like yeah there could be some sort of crossover between like Judith Butler and Foucault and like (laughs) like, yeah people who to do necromancy or something (laughs) why not (laughs) Yeah, that that is so fascinating. I mean, I think what's coming to mind is is this this more panpsychist understanding of reality, right? Where everything is sort of conscious or has a soul, and there's not this dead matter of the science of physicalism. And you know, another thing that comes to mind is uh, in parapsychology, some some researchers work with what's called a psychomantium. Uh, and we actually have one at West Georgia uh, upstairs in in the in the Melson Hall. And basically, a psychomantium. Uh, I hope I get this right. So I'm going to try. Is you kind of it's like a dark lit room, 
uh, it, it's a mirror. Okay, so there's a mirror there, and you kind of sit in a in a relaxing chair, and you you stare at the mirror, and you sort of have the intention uh, that you want to talk to maybe somebody that has passed away. Okay, I think I think I got that right. And so and then so what happens right after sort of staring in the mirror? So I guess it's similar in some ways to scrying. I don't know if anybody know you know it's familiar with scrying, but staring in the in the mirror, you know, it'll a lot of people will feel like a presence, or they'll they'll feel this apparitional, you know, experience that's there. Okay, so I don't know. It's kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. How do we you know make sense of that? You know, we're sort of you know psychoanalysis talks a lot about projection, the importance of projection. You know, so maybe there's something there with projection. There's something there with maybe this this more consciousness based universe that we're tapping into. You know, this ultimate reality that we're then manifesting. So you know, it's interesting. I don't I don't think it's enough to see that as a kind of hallucination. Mm -hmm. That that it's, that's that's sort of a um, a diminishing answer. Right. It doesn't take into account sort of the, the richness, the fullness of what's actually going on. So yeah, it, and even when people discount things like that, like, oh, it was just a hallucination. OK, so say that that what that it was, that doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning. Why is that the thing that's being right. conjured or hallucinated? Like why there's some sort of reason and meaning to it. It's not just like writing the the the. The notion that you should just write something off because it's like, you know, just a hallucination. It's like that, you know, you can't do that. Because like, where is it coming from? Why are you hallucinating that and not something else? You know, <laughs> like there's yeah, it's, yeah. It's so much richer even than that. And I think it's so important to have a more like animist view and not this like material view of the earth specifically, because if we did feel like the earth was alive which obviously it is <laughs> like everything else everything that lives on the earth is alive but not the earth so just like and we're all born from the matter of the earth but somehow it's not alive but we all are you know like that doesn't even make sense i'm sorry <laughs> so anyway um <laughs> but if we <laughs> had been thinking about the earth as alive this whole time like maybe it's not alive the same way we are like talking and walking around and stuff but like that doesn't mean it doesn't have its own sort of life to it you know and same with animals like this idea i remember reading something recently that said like doctors used to think babies didn't have like feeling because they because the like myelination of their fucking brain whatever like wasn't fully developed yet so that they couldn't feel pain and stuff and they used to like do surgeries on babies without like anesthesia it's just like what you know like there's like yeah or like all these horrible tests on animals like like cutting the bunny's eyelids off and then dropping chemicals in its eyes to see what it does to the animals like oh it can't feel that like of course it can feel that you know like it's just i don't even understand how people got to this point where they thought things like that but anyway um if we had a thought that animals and other people and, and babies and the earth and trees were all like living then like maybe we wouldn't be like totally devastating everything the way we are you know, hundred percent. I hundred percent agree. I think these are the big ethical questions, right? The critical theory and, and other you know fields try and have us think about, right? I mean, I you know, we, I talk a little bit about this in my chapter, just you know, from a post-humanist perspective, the ways that we we've, we've treated animals uh, in our society and through science has been absolutely unethical. And we need to take, we need to fix that. We need to change the way that we see animals, for example. And in, in terms of ecology, right? Thinking about the earth as alive, as something to commune with, you know, would be lead us on a different path, a different trajectory than the one that we're on, which is headed towards annihilation, which is mm -hmm. headed towards, you know, Armageddon or this, you know, wiping out of, you know, all, the, all us and speech and the earth and, you know, it's just awful. So, you know, so these are the important questions, right, for the future, right? And 
um, and the paranormal is part of that conversation, right? We need to understand, you know, how the paranormal can factor into a better future uh, for humans and for the planet. Perfect. And it always makes me think of the James Baldwin quote when he says, like, you know, some people see the moon and want to, like, dance underneath it, you know, and honor it. And other people want to, like, go mine it for resources, you know. Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> well that was lovely jake thank you so much for being here was there anything else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to anything else coming up or anything else that you're doing um nothing nothing coming up you know i'm just sort this of big conference this weekend this is the, the big conference <laughs> this weekend. yeah that's right I, I forgot and um yeah i mean just the you know the readers our, or, or watchers or listeners can can check out or find the book on Amazon. So if you just Google paranormal ruptures on Amazon, it should come right up. There's an ebook version, um, a print version. Um, so yeah, so go ahead and check it out. And um, yeah, I was really happy to be here and excited to talk with you. Thank you, Jake.